Today we are going to study the compliance system of lungs and chest wall. We have already covered the elastins in episode 2. I want you to understand these terminologies separately so that when we are discussing the physio pathophysiologies and the management of various diseases, you are better able to cope with the concepts and the terminologies. So let's get into it. talk about compliance it is the stretchability or the distensibility to a pull or a push right so it's a change in volume of a substance divided by change in pressure right so this equation will be repeated again and again so what is pressure or volume let's suppose we have a box and we fill it with a gas particle right 10 particles of gas molecules in a box now pressure is force exerted divided by area so force is exerted in the form of collisions against area which is the inner wall of the box right so what if I fill these 10 particles in a small box now the number of collisions would increase so the pressure would increase right wherever pressure increases compliance decreases but what if this box expands to this pressure then it would be able to increase in volume and the pressure would lessen up and that would mean it will be more compliant to the 10 particles. So before going into lungs, let's discuss a very low compliant system in a steel gas cylinder. Say for example, we fill it with high pressure gas, right? So when the cylinder is full, it will not distend as a result of which pressure would increase and wherever the pressure increases, compliance reduces. What about high compliance system in a balloon? Now, a very small amount of pressure is required and the balloon would inflate and accommodate more volume, right? So, it is a high compliance system where more volume change is there and less pressure change. So, let's see how lungs behave. As a result of pressure change, volume would increase, right? The pressure change of 3 in the intracrural pressures. We have already covered it in the last topic when the diaphragm moves downwards the pressure reduces as a result of which the net change in pressure is 3 and this would pull onto the lungs and inflate. If we see this on a pressure volume curve it would be this kind of line in green where you can see that the change in pressure of 3 is accommodating around 550 ml of volume. So to calculate the compliance of normal lung 550 divided by 3 is around 183 ml per centimeter of water. So the normal lung compliance is around 150 to 200 ml per centimeter of water. Let's say that the lung is fibrosed now. It's stiff in nature, so it would not expand, right? So in order to expand it to the same volume as healthy lung, more change in pressure is required. And wherever there is more change in pressure, the compliance reduces. So, if we draw it on the pressure volume curve, it would flatten or it would shift rightwards as a result of which the same 550 ml of volume would now be accommodated at around 6 centimeter of water pressure change, right? So, if we were to calculate the compliance of a stiff lung, it would be 550 divided by 6 and that would yield us 90 ml per centimeter of water. So you see how a normal healthy lung accommodates 550 ml of volume of gas to a net pressure change of 3, whereas a stiff lung would require greater pressure change of 6 to accommodate the same volume as a healthy lung. So how about a highly compliant system? Let's mark it in purple. So in a highly compliant system, the net change in pressure of 3 would further expand the lung, right? So, to accommodate 550 ml, it would require only 1.5 centimeter of water change in pressures and it would be shifted leftwards. So, calculating the compliance system now, it is around 366 ml of gas per centimeter of water pressures, right? So, you see how the high compliance system has more compliance compared to the green colored normal lung. So this is the basic of compliance. 
Now let's go into more refinement, right? The realistic compliance curve of alveolus. It is never a straight line. The alveoli behave in a sigmoidal manner. So if I were to draw a black colored sigmoid shaped uh, curve, this is how the alveoli behave. Note that the lower part, the red zone, is low compliance system. Then it switches to a green zone, which is a high compliance system. And the upper part is again flattened out into low compliance system. In the red zone, the low compliance system, a change of 4 would accommodate only 60 ml of volume. But once it reaches into the green zone, the same change in pressure would generate 200 ml of expandability. So this is high compliance system of the lungs. And the upper zone again flattens out into a high compliant system or the red zone. So what about these orange zones? Now these are the inflection points, the lower inflection point and the upper inflection point. Beyond the inflection point, you can see the lung goes into high compliant zone. Now do not feel overwhelmed by these concepts. I will be explaining it in an easier way through a balloon analogy. So what happens in a balloon? When we inflate a balloon, initially it is in the red zone of compliance curve. So greater pressure is required and very minimalistic volume change occurs. But if you persist, then beyond a point known as the lower inflection point of orange zone, the balloon starts inflating as at a relatively lower pressures until it reaches the high compliant green zone. So this is when a very small change in pressure would cause a greater change in volume of the balloon and it would inflate further. Now what happens when you inflate the balloon beyond a certain pressure limit? It reaches the upper curve, the red zone. This is where no more change in volume occurs and if you further inflate, then the pressure starts to rise and the balloon bursts. Now the alveoli in the lungs behave in a similar way as the balloons. Initially, there is a red zone, the low compliant system, where surface tension is very high. As a result of which, very high pressures are required to generate a volume change in the alveolus. Right? But what happens when this alveolus reaches the inflection point, let's say 5 centimeters of water? Beyond that, the alveolus falls into the high compliant zone. This is where a very small change in pressure would generate a greater change in volume in the alveolus, just like the balloon. So what happens beyond a certain point known as the upper inflection point, the alveolus reaches the low compliant system. This is where over expansion of alveolus has occurred. It would no longer expand. Now as per Laplace's law, we have read that surface tension is directly proportional to radius, right? So what happens now is that when the radius increases and the surfactant disperses, surface tension comes into play and surface tension tends to move the alveolus back into its initial collapsing position, right? This prevents over distension. Now if you inflate something beyond a certain pressure, it would explode. The same occurs with the alveolus. So at the pressures greater than 30 centimeters of water, if you expand the alveolus, there is a strong chance that it would no longer expand and burst. This is known as barotrauma. This is where it gets really interesting. Let's say on expiration, the end expiratory pressures reach zero, right? Below the lower inflection points. So on next breath, it would require greater pressure to re-expand the alveolus. So what if the lung is already in ARDS and the diseased alveolus is already low compliant? marked in red and the healthy alveolus right beside it would accommodate all the flow that was supposed to go into both alveoli as a result of which it would cause barotrauma of the healthy alveolus it would over expand now how can I prevent this what if I were to keep this end expiratory pressure above 5 centimeters right this is called peak end expiratory pressure or the PEEP, right? If I were to apply PEEP to the lung, what would happen then? Now, on next expiration, the diseased alveolus and the healthy alveolus would both remain above the lower inflection points or in the green zone of the compliance curve. So, flow would go uniformly in both alveoli this time. 
as a result of which barrow trauma would be avoided in healthy lung and we could recruit the diseased lung for the next breath. This is the principle behind the CPAP, the BiPAP of non-invasive ventilation and of course PEEP in the invasive ventilation. So PEEP or peak and expiratory pressures reduce the pressure changes and improve the compliance of the lungs. Now initially I was supposed to talk about hysteresis curve as well. This is a very important topic because from even examination point of view all the books that you will study will cover this kind of diagram for the compliance system of lungs. But we will be discussing this in the coming episode, right? So that you are not overwhelmed by the concepts that are already being given in this topic. So let's just skip to the next topic. Now what about the compliance of chest wall? You know, imagine if you were to inflate a balloon in a small box, wouldn't it reduce the compliance of balloon if the box is rigid, right? So in the same way, any disease that reduces the compliance of chest wall reduces the overall compliance of lung as well, right? So let's not go into the detail of chest wall because it's got a lot of algorithms, but overall remember where chest wall and lungs have almost equal compliance, combined system compliance is always reduced to 100 ml per centimeter of water. In the next episode, we will apply these concepts of compliance in spontaneously breathing patient and a patient on mechanical ventilator. Stay tuned.